Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Locke. And I'm Carol Law, um, so you know which round we are. We are. Um, Rebecca and I have been delivering courses together in anticoagulation, VTE management, VT prevention for over 20 years now. So um, that, that we've been doing this for a very long time and we've been involved with the National Nursing and Midwifery Network since its inception. So we're delighted to be here today to, to focus on, on the role of the nurse in VTE prevention and management. And we're, we're using the term nurse, but obviously the NNMN is the National Nursing and Midwifery Network. And we, we, we're very, especially following on from Dr. Bonnet's session, we're very conscious that the knowledge and skills that are involved in nursing um, are also there for midwives. And so although we're saying nurse, we know that the, we're hopefully that this applies to, to the midwives in the audience as well. So um, we, we're, we're going to sort of think about the nurse's role in the assessment of risk for VTE and the implementation of thromboprophylaxis. Um, and they are um, significant issues for all healthcare professionals, but we're going to perhaps try and tease out some special things for, for nurses. Um, and, um, then their, and then their role in actually the um, prevention of, of HAT um, as part of the interventional team and, and a little bit about their role in diagnosis and treatment, but probably more in treatment than diagnosis. So um, the challenge for nurses and midwives, um, as we see it, is to ensure that every patient who is admitted to hospital is assessed for the risk of VTE. And we've talked about that in some depth today. And that for patients at risk of VTE, thromboprophylaxis is managed appropriately. And that patients who have been diagnosed with VTE receive timely, safe and effective anticoagulation because that's sort of what we're trying to, the risk assessment is leading to. So when we think about why is VT prevention important, you can look at that in under sort of three headings, the patient, healthcare and society. And certainly having to listen to John talking about his experience, it becomes very obvious that from the patient's perspective, there's the difficulties and pains um, of the actual conditions itself. Ben and Dr Mukherjee talked about the complications that are associated with VTE. Um, the, there's the impact on their lifestyle and, um, and, and how it makes them feel generally. As far as healthcare is concerned, obviously it's very costly. VTE is costly, it's time consuming. Um, and uh, especially if you don't uh, apply to GERFT, you know, getting it right first time and you have to come back to the problem. And from society's point of view, you've got patients not being in the workforce and so loss of productivity and just loss of trust in healthcare and health services generally. So... So I think that what, what we're saying is that we have a duty to make sure this doesn't happen because it's a preventable... It's condition. a preventable condition. So that's why diagnosis of VT and appropriate anticoagulation are so important. And we've seen it can be very complicated diagnosis. And there's certainly a, a, a major physical and psychological impact, as John described so, so clearly, um, particularly if um, errors are made and the individual loses faith in the healthcare provision. And they may resort to alternative forms of or sources of information. And they're you know, John described very eloquently how um, scary the process is. So it, I think it's important to think about the work of Rachel Hunter here, who very specifically has looked at uh, post-thrombotic panic syndrome and um, thromboneurosis and how many patients who have developed VTE go on to really have an impact on their mental health. So when we come to treating and preventing clots, we need to think about the different tasks that need to be carried out um, by nurses and midwives and the, and the different levels of seniority. So 
There's the tasks that are involved in management and the clinical governance, which will fall toward managers, nurse specialists, anticoagulant nurse specialists, thrombosis nurse specialists, and consultant nurses. Whereas the delivery, it will be undertaken by staff nurses, healthcare assistants, and ward level staff. And the, the needs and requirements and education of those differ. So, if, if we start thinking about that the, the organisation, the management, the clinical governance associated with VTE treatment and prevention, like any other condition, um, somebody needs to have an overview to see the big picture to make sure that everything is put in place. And I think we've had some good examples of that while we've been listening to the sessions today, um, where Dr Bennett was talking about you know, the communication between the different departments. We've had a think about perhaps different ways of working, when Dr. Mukherjee was talking about maybe having a thrombosis and um, pulmonary hypertension clinic working together. So somebody needs to have that big picture to, to make those sort of innovations happen. Um, so, uh, uh, and the other ways that we can perhaps think about doing this is making sure that, that senior nurses are active members of the Trust Thrombosis Committee, um, ensuring that appropriate thromboprophylaxis takes place for each of um, individual patients. So actually having an insight into what best practice is, promoting um, best practice with regard to BT prevention treatment and the management of anticoagulation so that all those things happen as they should and we've mentioned the getting it right first time uh, work already several times now but I, I think that it's so important that we make sure that that actually gets translated into action um, and then education has come up a lot and so from the, from the senior nurse's point of view, that cascade learning regarding VTE, anticoagulation and thromboprophylaxis is a, a, a big part of the role. Undertaking audit, and Bex talked about the National Thrombosis Survey. So those sorts of activities are very important for helping us move practice forward. Um, and just Jane, driving change in general and enabling best practice. So when we think about delivery, which is from mainly from the nurses on the wards in this circumstance, we need to we need to ensure that the that people in this area are able to recognise the signs and symptoms of DVT and pulmonary embolism, pulmonary embolism, that they're unaware of the VT risk assessment and they know when it's been properly completed and that they can ensure that documentation is appropriate and well carried out. Checking correct prophylaxis and the treatment is being prescribed, possibly in association, well, definitely in association with the pharmacists. Delivery of thromboprophylaxis, so that's administering the low molecular heparin, and that can be as simple as giving a very good um, injection, ensuring that there's no bruising, making sure it's as pain-free as possible for the patient so that they don't dread it. Administering all anticoagulants, applying the correct fitting stockings in the correct way and checking the skin, ensuring that it's healthy and managing intermittent compression. And then we thought, the previous speakers talked about the, the importance of not miss, having missed doses and preventing missed doses. And certainly the safe administration of anticoagulation at the time of the ward, when the patient is on the ward, but also when the patient is discharged, because that is often the time when this all falls down, when the patient goes home. And um, to ensure that that happens properly, empowering the patient by giving them good education. It was rather disappointing to hear, or despondent, to hear John's explanation that he virtually had no education, no patient leaflets. And so that is something that we can do something about. So to do this correctly, we need to think about the knowledge and skills of thromboprophylaxis and how safe anticoagulation can be achieved for, treat, for the treatment of VTE. So the focus of education will differ depending on the level of seniority and the specific role each nurse has, but all will need to understand what VTE is primarily. If you're in senior management level, um, you're going to need to know about action planning or the audit cycle, all of those change management skills, documentation, what documentation should be in place, what evidence you're basing your, the practice of your trust on, safe administration, 
um, you've got to have leadership skills and understand the guidelines and legislation and really keep up to date with policies and procedures and be able to communicate that to your staff with good presentation skills, research literacy. Um, whereas at the ward level, that, that's a different set of skills and a, therefore a different set of educational needs. So they're going to need to have an understanding of risk assessment and what it is and why it's so important and completing documentation, how to give a good injection of low molecular weight heparin, what, what constitutes that, um, management of your stockings and your IPCs, the role of exercise and hydration, what anticoagulants are available and how and why they work, um, and the safe administration, and understand about safe discharge, safe disposal of sharks, and crucially, and I think that's come across over and over again today, what the patient needs to know, what patient education they, is available. You need to know what that is. You need to know where to get the patient information leaflets. You need to have them on your ward. And John, a le simple leaflet for John may have helped an awful lot. You need to know the pathways for an anticoagulated patient and what's going to happen to them when they leave your care. So this is a complex and involved process and it needs complex and involved um, education. Um, and it need, that needs to be acknowledged that this is um, high level thinking. So we, we really need to understand what underpins all this. And several of our speakers have made reference to the evidence that does that. And so Rebecca talked about the knowledge and skills. So one of the, one of the things that nurses who are in decision-making positions need to do is to be able to understand the evidence and to be able to interpret it and make sure that they, it, can, they can put it into practice. And so we, in this country, we have a variety of evidence, uh, evidence that we can draw on, mainly from NICE. So we've got their, their guidance on um, venous thromboembolism in the over 16s, which was updated in, um, in 2019 for reducing the risk in hospital. And then we've got the uh, NG158 guidance that was published in March 2020 on the diagnosis and management of VTE. Um, and, uh, and, and covers thrombophilia testing as well. And going alongside that, published in August this year, are the new quality standards on venous thromboembolism in adults. And so this has taken the, the standards from the, about um, VTE uh, uh, management and um, hospital acquired thrombosis and put them together and we now have five I think it's five standards that we can perhaps be measuring our practice against and then well, I think we sort of teased a little bit about about, about outpatient management of PE when, when um, Dr Mukherjee was talking and there are now some British Thoracic Society quality standards for the outpatient management of PE that were published in uh, last year no earlier this you know, no, last, last year, year 20, <laughs> I've lost the years. Um, and, and so, so there, there, you know, that, that is going to become increasingly important. I think um, Dr. Shapiro was talking about, you know, the, the sort of those virtual wards and, you know, how are we going to perhaps see that more, perhaps we're going to see more of that. So understanding outpatient management is going to become very important to us. Mm -hmm. And then there's the key therapeutic topic 16 on anticoagulants, which includes direct or um, direct anting or acting oral anticoagulants, which was up updated um, September 2019. And I think this is very important when we're thinking about anticoagulation, because because what it does is it reinforces the, the work of the National Patient Safety Agency, which was published um, in 2007, and that's a long time ago. But what they make quite clear is that the principles that were outlined in that guidance still apply today for the management of safer anticoagulation. And there are really three key areas that they stress on um, us taking on board and that's information and awareness and I think that that's so come through today. Uh, dosing and administration errors, um, we need to make sure we get this right so to avoid all those at the, any complications of anticoagulation and then to understand more about the interaction contraindications um, and, and warnings that, that go along with anticoagulation. So um, anybody who is dealing with anticoagulant actually needs that knowledge and understanding 
Um, and then for the midwives, there's the um, Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Green Top Guidelines on um, reducing the risk of VTE in pregnancy and the perpium, and the same, um, the guidance also on thromboembolic disease in pregnancy. And so these are, these are the guidelines that in this country we would be adhering to, but if you're listening to us from another country, there will be local guidelines. And I think that we need, to, you know, everybody needs to make sure they understand their local guidance and see how it integrates into practice. And just one more set of guidance that we haven't put on the slide um, was is the guidance on pneumonia um, that um, Dr. Shapiro mentioned, um, and I think that that it's because of the the clots and the, and that were involved with COVID that that was removed. But I think we need to keep an eye on that and make sure we we think about that as well. So so I think. It's quite clear from today that if we hadn't really thought about it before, knowledgeable nurses and healthcare professionals can make a difference in uh, um, the prevention and treatment of venous thromboembolism. John, John's session really brought home to me that if we know the signs and symptoms of VTE, it can save, it can save lives. And that if we understand who's at risk of hospital acquired thrombosis and how to achieve appropriate thromboprophylaxis, you know, we can actually then think about how we're going to reduce the, that um, mortality and chronic health problems and long-term disability that can be associated with it. Um, John's I think this is these sessions are being recorded. They will be available on the Thrombosis UK website. And I think that it would be good to encourage your colleagues to, to listen to what John had to say in terms of how his um, VTE event was managed. But also the other thing that's on the, the Thrombosis UK website is Paul Robinson, the ex um, Blackburn Spurs England goalkeepers experience of having a pulmonary embolism. And that's a very useful thing to listen to that really brings home the fact that we do need to understand these things, um, as well as understanding how anticoagulants work um, so that we can reduce the side effects and produce motor adherence, to know the red flags of anticoagulants so that our patients can um, help themselves as well and understand those red, red flags and perhaps reduce some of that anxiety that John was talking yes. about. Um, and then if as healthcare professionals we understand these things, we can then go and teach our patients. I think one of the questions that was uh, typed in by one of the, our participants today was putting the patient at the centre of care. And I think that is just really what we should be thinking about much more. So the current challenges for education in practice, and one of the things that happened today is that education has come up a lot. So we've got some, we have some sort of challenges COVID-19, it has been a challenge for everybody. Everyone's got limited time. Isolation of patients and staff and infection control issues mean that people can't get together to share information. Everyone's workload um, has increased and there's a backlog of cases. Potentially, this means poor access to anticoagulation, thromboprophylaxis, experts, and a lack of educational materials and courses as a, as a result of this. So what we've, what we've been privileged to do is to work with Thrombosis UK and um, the National Nursing and Midwifery Network to put forward an anticoagulation and VTE learning program. Um, and on your screen, you can see what the first sort of shot of, um, the, of, of the first little film that we've done um, and the, what the second slide is going to look like. Um, but what, what it aims to do is to provide an introduction to venous thromboembolism for staff, nurses and junior clinical staff working in secondary care and it particularly focuses on the consequences care and management um, of VTE with a specific focus on the role of anticoagulation. And we've done this through four short films. 
So the first is called Venus Clots Explained, um, and that, as uh, you might guess, sets its focus on what it focuses on what VTE is and how it's diagnosed. The second is anticoagulation treatment, and because it is so central to managing VTE, that's why we've included that. The third is about prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis, and we've broken that down into four steps, which hopefully, if one keeps that what in one's mind, we can make thrombos thromboprophylaxis happen and make sure we do get it right first time um, and then the final one is on discharging patients on anticoagulation and ensuring uh, really ensuring a safe transfer to the community and again the, when John was speaking the importance of that was really brought home to me that we can't just think about what's happening in hospital we have to think about what's going to happen to our patients when we, we discharge them. So when Carol and I were sort of conceiving this whole idea of having some short, easy films that can be used as an educational resource, um, we, we envisaged that we would be able to make them very easily accessible to people on the ward. So this is how you would actually um, get on. What you need to do is to go onto the web, this uh, web link. Um, at Thrombosis UK. If you click on this, um, not on this um, actual slide presentation, but if you click on that when you get to Thrombosis UK, then it should take you through to the films. Currently, there is only the first film up. Carol and I are still working on the other three, but watch this space. They will be here shortly, unless Joe's got any new information for us. Um, we, we sort of envisaged them as being a resource for um, anticoagulant nurse specialists, thrombosis nurse specialists who need to get education to the ward, to the, to the bedside. Um, and, and so that it ensures that your staff when you're in your trust in your hospital have an increased knowledge um, and are able to look after their patients better. And when someone like John comes into the ward and asks questions, they can answer it. Because I think one of the problems that patients don't get clear information is because nurses and midwives don't have enough education and don't understand it or don't feel confident enough to explain the situation to a patient. It, these films will also be available, obviously, for sisters on wards, matrons, um, and then who can then ensure that all staff have viewed them. It can maybe the um, team can highlight that they exist by email to the various um, departments. And I think it's very important if you are sort of using these films that you get feedback from each maybe organized session just to see how they're going, how they're being received and if there's anything else that um, your staff need. So hopefully this will help you in your role as a, an educationalist for your trust. And if you do use the films in that way, um, we would actually like some feedback on, on how they went, how you find using them, and if there's any tweaks that you think we should perhaps make or any any additions, because it's it, it's very useful to, to have that. So um, just to, to conclude then, um, I, 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 we've been working with nurses in this field for over 20 years now Long time. and and i think that we do really feel that nurses and, and midwives can contribute significantly to vt prevention and treatment um, from both the organizational perspective and from and really you know on that hands-on level they they definitely do that um, and education of nurses at all levels is, is really central to that so that hopefully that we can put ourselves in a position where somebody like John when asked a question by Emma um, about what he felt would, would be able to say yes I got this information I felt really safe and secure when I went home and I knew where to turn so and um, I knew what was going to happen so, to me yeah and what so, to expect so thank you all for listening any questions Thank you very much to you both. That was a wonderful summary of, um, I think, just sort of highlighting and really clarifying what our role is on a day-to-day -day basis, how we can reduce the risk of VTE, how we can make the whole process of uh, thrombosis easier for patients. Um, and I think that one of the things that Bex talked about in her talk this morning was um, from the Getting It Right First Time report, that we're still not very good at patient information um, I think perhaps there is a big discrepancy in, in the information that we give compared to what's recorded or documented as being given. Um, but I think that we're all, all of all of us really are in a good position to 
drip feed information to patients about VTE. We're all short on time, but I think that, you know, if you're giving the lamotrigine heparin, if you're fitting your patients for stockings, if you're doing the risk assessment, they're all really good points in the patient's pathway just to mention, this is your risk of thrombosis. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that means? Um, and so I think it's just being a bit smart, isn't it? Trying to use our time in the best way, really. Yeah. Um, the videos look amazing and, and um, such so overdue we've needed something like this for a long long time and so thanks very much to you both for your time i know you've put a lot of effort and hard work into creating those and um, somebody asked about um primary care and and I, as i was just thinking about that i think um that they will all apply to primary care won't they i think they will i think the key one i i, I was a district nursing sister for about 10 years a long time ago but one of the problems is that interface between secondary care and primary care and um, making sure that the discharge is good. So we have got a session on discharging patients and that will stress communication with primary care. I agree with you. I think all the information about what is a VTE will apply to equally to secondary care and primary care. But once you've watched them, if you think working in primary care, that there is a specific need that hasn't been covered, then that's the sort of feedback we need. Currently, we're not doing one specifically for primary care. You know, time is time is tricky, <laughs> but um, I'm sure we could in the future if there was sort of specific need and we had, you know, that's a specific focus was being left out from the four films that we've um, worked on. Yeah, like you say, the idea is to be inclusive and, and if it yes. isn't meeting the needs of um, a big area of healthcare, then I guess that's something we could look at. Yes. Um, and somebody asked as well whether there would be any sort of assessment at the end of the videos in order for us to use this within our trust to have some sort of um, assurance of competency. Oh, um, jo, jo, would you like to put your sound on <laughs> and discuss what, where, where we're at with that? <laughs> At the moment, we are looking at how we can develop the platform, um, but this is going to take some time so that once we have the films and others, people can log in and they will have open access, but it will be a login so that once you've completed a certain length, either an individual video, um, film rather, or a length of say an hour or more, it will either be um, a certificate or possibly CPD accredited. But that it is, we need to get these films done and then we need to work down how we can do this um, on the platform basically but that's that is our intention um, to prov uh, to provide that yes wonderful i think we may have another question oh no it's just a thank you lovely <laughs> <laughs> thank you too <laughs> thank you both very very much and again for all your help in putting today together um i've really enjoyed it and i've learned so much the presentations have been wonderful and i think we've succeeded in our aim to dig beneath the risk assessment and we've we've explored so much haven't we just in one day 